Um, my name is Deidre Tolk. I'm a senior distribution designer with Trico. I've only been with the company about four months. Um, prior to that, I was with our sister co-op at SSVEC, which is also in Southern Arizona. I was there about eight years. And then prior to that, I had about 14 years as a drafting and design specialist at uh, Raytheon Missile Systems and uh, Bombardier Aerospace. So I had a background in mechanical design prior to switching over to electric utility. I'm Megan Goff. I'm a distribution designer with Trico Electric. Been a designer for about three years with the cooperative for 12 years. Hi, I'm Wes Bernal. Uh, I was the AUD administrator before I abandoned these ladies and uh, didn't train them very well. So that's why I'm up here helping uh, kind of fill in some of the gaps. But uh, I was at Trico for uh, eight years. And prior to that, I was up in uh, Washington State as a designer as well. And then I worked for another consulting firm prior to that, uh, doing storm restoration work and, and uh, field work. So, um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's where I, I'll fill in from here occasionally. He's an honorary badge. I, yeah, if you see it flipped over and it says formerly Trico or trader of Trico. So my background with AUD is the last four months. I'm prior to that, I used different staking and design software. So I'm just going to give you a quick overview of Trico, and then I'll let them give you a demo and some information about how we use AUD. Um, currently, Trico has just over 48,000 members and 53,000 services. Um, the more, majority of that is residential, and energy sold is sitting right at 820,000 megawatts megawatt hours, and then our peak demand is running at 250 or just over. Um, we got a kind of a good chuckle yesterday. We were looking at um, some of the other presenters, SCE, and then again this morning with Hydro One. Our total employees is about 145, and they've got like double that in just designers. So we're we're pretty small. And we have seven board districts. We cover about 2,500 square miles of service territory in three different counties. And we go from just north of Tucson down to the Mexican border, and we actually have one service that extends down into Mexico. Um, we've got 4,000 miles of distribution line. And if you're not familiar, Trico is a cooperative. Um, we're member-owned, um, nonprofit, heavily involved in the community with community service projects and um, youth programs. We have scholarships, and then one of my favorites is Washington Youth Tour, where we send kids to D.C. every year. Um, our mission is dedicated to making a difference in the communities we serve by providing our members cost-effective and sustainable energy solutions. After working in, in profit companies and, and government contracting agencies, working for a member-owned uh, co-op for me has been incredible. Just being able to work with our members and do our best to save them money, um, it's a great, great place to work. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to you guys. So we're currently using AUD 8.2 with AutoCAD 2020. We have five field designers, two subdivision designers, and two to three engineers that actively use AUD. And we just recently have a contractor who's also using AUD. Um, we are an NISC member, and I know with UDH and GIS that did present some challenges getting connected, but it did get worked out. Um, we implemented AUD in 2018. We decided in 2019 that it should be reconfigured with a lot of customizations. So we partnered with a consulting firm and we designated one AUD administrator, which was Wes here, and three subject matter experts to help with in Trico to help test the templates. All of our testing was in 2020 um, and it was live. So a new template went out, we would have to update the configuration each time. So that AUD config update was a big <laughs> command that we used. Uh, we finally got a solid template in 2021. We've had some slight modifications along the way, but it's pretty much the same product it's been since then. So that's kind of all we have in terms of a presentation. We were going to do a demonstration to show you how we're using AUD.
as far as this, uh, how we're using it, uh, since we went with, I, didn't, I have to apologize to Pat here because we went with a really full on customization mode and it has fully come back full circle to haunt us on uh, making sure that uh, we use it a little differently moving forward. So I think there, uh, Trico will be probably defaulting back more to out of the box, but trying to get some of those functionalities to that we'll present here on some of the customizations that happened. Uh, some of those customizations, I, I don't know if they're capable or not, but uh, they are going to be handy. So I would say about 80% of what you see here, you won't be able to use unless we get the uh, SPS on board to try to see if we can't implement some of the, I'm going to call them fancy tools that we use and have integrated. So what we did is we created this ribbon um, that kind of mimics our workflow. We've got the work order browser where we can pull up uh, any work order that is in our system. We have this little button, the get work order, and you can pull that up and it's all linked, you can link there. We ran into a lot of issues where we were creating designs and then our designers were trying to publish materials, but it wasn't getting published into the right folder. So then we couldn't pull up, I don't know how to explain it properly. We didn't properly implement the EAM side of things. And so whenever the whenever that went live, whenever they would do a save as type of feature for our designs, they were getting saved in the no man's land folder. And so we're, they were kept getting lost and I kept breaking the link every single time that we did that. So we had to go back to SPS and try to reconfigure that. So everything was kind of configured originally through that 2014 to that 2018 period to where it was for as intelligent as a program as it was, it was about the stupidest thing I'd ever seen as a designer. <clears throat> we had, you know, based on the limited resources we had, uh, I volunteered to do it and try to make those enhancements. And I, I, I love making things more efficient. And so as we went through each of these processes, I was trying to go for as efficient as possible, not thinking about aftercare. So, um, but yeah, that the little uh, go to button for the the work order i don't think that's a standard thing that happens that was we had it built in early on and we requested it to come back so uh, for us it was just we didn't it just reduced clicks and that was kind of my overall goal uh in that uh in that tool and that's why we showed that one so. All right, I guess I'll speak through it as we as we drive here. So again, as the we as we worked through the ribbon up top, I wanted it to mimic the workflow, uh, as as Megan mentioned. So whenever you bring up those work orders, it kind of again it mimicked the workflow from the time you started to as as you worked through the design process. One of the things that we implemented was can you bring up the yeah we had uh, a list for team that was run that ran through here so. One of the frustrating points we had is as we input as we inputted all of our poll data, there was no phase associated with it, and so you had to go back in and add phases. This defaulted it to where we were able to, hey, we, this is this line, this tap is going to be a phase because it wasn't auto sensing because we had bad ma map data, um, in in some cases, or at least that wasn't coming across. So we had it defaulted here for our basic design. So uh, another. Um, Thing that we also did was on these you see project items here it's either customer or trico there's times where the the client or the customer is going to be installing uh material and this default or customer versus trico uh kind of like the suffix side of things would tell you whether or not trico was going to do it and then it also pushed it to our accounting software as well and allowed it to um you know, give those totals where they're responsible or, or, or uh, Trico would be responsible for that. And then there's also a difference between field and subdivision. In field and subdivision, they have different standards. Uh, they put heavier requirements on the, uh, the s subdivision builders. And so anytime you did that, there was a different uh, design process that took place and that enabled that to take, to, to handle as well. The 
bottom portion here, the light and heavy loading districts, uh, we changed our, some of our standard framing so that you could also get either heavy or light loading districts or a, a combination of. So uh, that was one of those design processes that you, as you worked from left to right that you could kind of dial that in. And I'm sure some of this was probably stolen from SRP. <laughs> Well, majority of it, I'm sure. Uh, all right. Let's see. All right. What else do we want to do here? We have a whole list of things. What else do we want to work on? So one of the cool things with, with when we draw, we have some automations come in. Depending on connectivity, the subunits will automatically order. So if you look at this transformer right now we only have primary connected to it on one side so we've got an arrestor elbow but when I go in and connect here you'll see that the material automatically updated to give us two elbows and a fault indicator and it took off that arrestor elbow this feature really just works on anything that's existing or new when you have something that you're trying to modify that is existing and you're tapping off of, you might have to come go in and, and manipulate some of the assembly units. Um, the other cool feature that we had with subdivisions, a lot of times we have conduit stub outs already so when we go to draw the service we have some existing conduit and the new conduit with conductor all the way through so we did have this tool created where if you connect to a transformer like say we had 50 feet of existing conduit and then if you right click it'll keep moving through the command and then we have the new stuff when you create a work location it'll show you that existing conduit the new conduit footage and then the total run through the transformer There is an issue with this, with the connections. Say anything? Whenever you had to utilize this tool, it wouldn't auto, it wouldn't auto connect or create the connectivity. So you had to create the, you had to go and just double check all your connections, which in most cases you had to, you have to do with everything is just make sure all your connectivity is good. Most of the, yeah, connection there. So that was a tool that, for the way that we have done, like they do all of, they call it spine lines <clears throat> or the main infrastructure inside subdivisions. So every time every new service came on, you had to have, sometimes our mapping wasn't up to date <clears throat> because at a cooperative, it feels like you're many people wear many hats type of things. And so it doesn't actually get pushed through in a timely manner. So you end up with situations like this where you have to show the existing conduit and then uh, build upon that as, as you move through your design, so. So the other thing is, as designers, we are the ones going out there, designing it, we're field staking it, we're creating the cost estimations, we're doing the as built. So when the field copy comes back to us to as built, if we know that our line footage is is right but the wire footage might be off rather than having to move the meter we have an override feature where we can put in what the uh, you can over, put in. yeah you can override the footage so like it with most of uh most cable, I mean, everyone knows a line-to-line -line footage, and every utility probably looks at that different where they want to know about the extra footage. And so we just did a, an adder. 
Uh, so every time you would do a transformer, it would automatically add seven feet because you know the linemen are going to burn, you know, five feet of that doing their makeup or something like that as it exits the ground. Uh, you know, same thing with pole risers as well. Uh, it would reference the, the pole height and give you an additional footage plus a little extra. But if you ever wanted to manually override that, you're free to override that and get your exact footage. And for us, it really helped on the as-built side of things because our as-built have to res reflect exactly what the linemen put in there, even though we know the linemen wrote the wrong numbers or at least gave us additional footage. So. I know, I think it was, I don't remember who it was, maybe it was APS. So you guys touched on uh, work order, like aligning your work orders, whether they're side to side, vertical or whatever it might be. That was another uh, tool that we ended up uh, having, which was being able to align all of your work orders. Uh, you can go ahead and run that command. There it is. So every time you did a job, you'd end up coming in and let's say you had, I don't know, 50 locations or something like that. You could set the spacing requirements and the rows that existed in there. And with, uh, you would run this command and then it, you would set up all of your, uh, I don't remember what they call them. On your work location, you had like the I unique identifier of where that was at and then all the work locations. And as soon as you ran it, it would automatically just shuffle them into one clean area so that you could um, keep it clean and keep it standard. Because if not, you were constantly moving around to try to make it adjust and make it look right. Um, so that was one that we ended up having to to run and it just made our staking sheets look a lot cleaner for how we used them for, um, like I said, every, every utility wants them to look a certain way. We we're just trying to mimic what we had previously. So, uh, we felt that whenever they were on the design itself, instead of a separate viewport, uh, that it just cluttered up the design. And so this kind of provided us something clean so they could have work locations on one page and the actual construction work happening on another. So another thing was these dummy pole heads. Um, when you have a pole head on a pole, we have these lines that automa automatically pop up just so you know that you've got something on there rather than only seeing that pole. Uh, it helps us when we're designing to know we've got something out there. And these also, if we tapped off of this going south, It'll, it should pop up with another one. Right here. It didn't do it on the other one. Well, this one, it shows the alignment, so we know that it's going north. Um, the the reason the intent that we had for that is because I'm I'm really simple minded person, and I look at a pole, I just see a pole. Uh, there, I didn't know if there was anything on it. And some of our, if we decided to turn off validations because we knew it wasn't perfect, uh, cause some once in a while we just wanted to override what the standards were or the lineman decided that, um, it, it fit outside the scope of what those defaults were. Uh, I wanted to be able to not necessarily have to highlight a poll, go into the feature info and then click on my poll head. I just wanted to click on my poll head and see what was there. That was the reason for the shortcut. And for me, it reduced a click and I was happy. So, what up? Okay. So, the other thing that I found, which was kind of cool, and I don't know if this is a feature that can happen in regular AUD, um, but there's a street view option. And, like, if you had a job and you needed to look at a poll, but you maybe didn't want to go out into the field. Within NetMaps, you can get a street view right there and get your inventory, depending on how up-to-date it is. Oh, yeah, that's right. So the other thing with this is when we have contractors that need to pick up material from our warehouse, we used to go through and create a Excel spreadsheet manually. With AUD, we can have all this information 
and then there's a table if we click this export when it's linked um you won't get as many warnings it'll it grabs the developer's name and everything but you load that in and then it's got all of the material that a contractor would need to pick up from our warehouse and then our warehouse we do have to put this into our software manually for our warehouse to view but it saves a lot of typing uh trico tends to be a little old school and some of the stuff that they do but one of the things that we uh had uh, configured was uh, a lot of times they just wanted to know the total footage for cable uh, and what was either being added at ends or anything like that so they want to know that total footage they also have another table in here for materials so whenever the linemen get it they just know hey i'm going to pull out 25 25 transformers a pad mount switch and something else uh that it was this would give them kind of like the reader's digest version of what they're looking for so that they can head out to the field with you know the things they really care about for installation purposes so we call it a dry type it's a single phase uh primary sectionalizer of sorts or a transformer same thing with pad mount switches pmes and so on and so forth uh, any of that major equipment would would populate here and it gave them uh spaces to uh identify the transformers the switch numbers the cable reel numbers all of this data that that would, could be helpful for um, as-built information. It just gave them a place, and we would incorporate this in the staking sheets so they had a place to write it down because our linemen always complained about having to write notes. Um, so we're just trying to make it as simple as possible. And no, they didn't fill this out either. So um, on some of our symbology, on this, uh, on this custom assembly unit, we had this one added because our standards were a little slower than design and then we were also kind of slow on the roll to get things put into AUD. It, but the one thing that was nice is that our accounting system would recognize any CU that we put in. So we put this other, we had this other one put in and you could name in any CU. Um, you, you could type in banana and it would accept it. It would put banana on your work location. But if the if whatever was typed in here had a recognizable CU in the accounting system, it would include it on your work order. So uh, it didn't matter what you were using, uh, as long as as long as our accounting system recognized what it was. Like if it's a a forty class four, or if it's a they called it a UK five um, transformer pole head VC one VC one one OP, whatever it is. If it if you had it in there, it would recognize it and it would in, it would add it on the work location, and it would actually push to uh, to the accounting side to get you a, a cost estimate. Uh, so a lot of a lot of scenarios where they're adding new new equipment. Some of this was based off of kind of lead times. So once your lead times get long, all of a sudden your standards change and you have to make a spec. Uh, this helped facilitate that account uh, material wise. They could put it in. Uh, they could push it to the accounting, we could put it in and we wouldn't have to worry about standards saying, hey, we have to have this approved, we have to create a spec, we have to do all this stuff, we just smash and grab, let's go. Uh, this other feature that we had added, I think this might be an SRP steel, um, is uh, generate a tech spec. So anytime you had a unit out there on a pole, we had, a, we had our entire uh, design standard spec book broken out and individually named uh, as a PDF and so as you would click on any if assuming the specifications in there uh, if the if the spec was in there you could click on that run that um, in this case you can either have a book so my goal here was we didn't really utilize a lot of contractors to do a lot of our work everything was done in-house contractors would get uh hey what are you guys building and it's like oh voc1 well what what is that no one knows what that is this would ger generate a grouping of pdfs so i didn't have to go into our standards book and hand select every single one it picked it based off of the name of the cu so you could generate a book or a one-off thing so as you ran that 
it would end up giving you this specification of everything that was involved in the project. Transformers, pole heads, elbows, arresters, grounds, whatever it might be that's involved in your project. And it gave me a quick uh, summary of what was in the project. And I could hand it to a contractor and say, go and build. And for the most part, we do use our validations. There's sometimes we need to turn them on or off depending on if we're... Um, like if there was this existing transformer and we were adding in uh, primary, so there was an existing arrestor, we would have to actually show that as retired on our workstation rather than having it automatically just come off. So that our um, without having with having the validations on, it wouldn't let us add that arrestor on top of a new elbow. But for the most part, yeah, we do use the validations. They're, they work really well. Tell they don't. And then you turn them off. I try to tell all, um, all the designers to keep them on until you start running into issues. Don't start with them off because then, then it, you're just putting it all in manually, and that's not the point of AAD. I think. I think that's pretty much a wrap. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's pretty much everything else is, I would say, kind of standard out of the box. One of the thing, the other things that we did is uh, we renamed some of the, you know, naming conventions, which I think most people have done, uh, just to make it match more with what, you know, what we use. Um, you know, we don't use handholds. We call them UK5s or something like that. So um, some of that was the only unique thing that we changed. A lot of the blocks that I incorporated in there was... If we were using steel poles, I wanted them to look like steel poles. If it's a three-phase pad mount transformer, I wanted it to look top-down like a three-phase pad mount transformer. Um, single phase, same thing. Uh, yeah, you can change that to a three-phase. Well, Uh, so I, I, like I said, I'm, I'm a very literal person when it comes to this. So I wanted that pad, I wanted that to be there. And the same thing with the pads, cause you, you know, obviously separate your pad versus your basement. Uh, so when you put a different pad on there, it'll change, uh, as you go from a 500 kVA transformer up and beyond, it goes to a larger transformer and I wanted that transformer to look larger. So I put a larger transformer in, um, and you can also do the same thing. So the pads, the other thing we did was with the switches, which from a mapping standpoint, it's kind of a nightmare, but from an aesthetic uh, standpoint inside the design, like with switches, I drew them like a top down. I showed the switches, I showed the bay numbers and things like that. So from a mapping standpoint, as our mappers looked at it, they could actually see which bay it was coming out of uh, from a connectivity standpoint. So whenever they they had something to reference, it, it was that way in the design as well. So um, yeah, I think, I think that's pretty much it for the most part. But yeah. Now we get to do it all over again. Any questions? Thanks, Pat. Uh, Brian Winfield, Hydro One. Just a, I have a couple of questions, but I'll, I'll do one for now. Um, from a technical perspective, the material ticket um, process that you showed, is that through um, like a custom form report and then automated that way, is that essentially how it was built? Uh, it, I, I don't, I don't know. It's going to be a cuss word. I don't know what Dan used. Um, I don't know what he used to put in there. It's an Excel spreadsheet, and then we ran our, we ran our list routine with that little button. It just runs a list routine, and it identifies and breaks out. It recognizes the CU or the construction unit, and it would just add it to a, add it to the list, and then it would auto populate uh, each description and quantity and uh, and the unique identifier. Gotcha. Um, one more quick question, real high level. Um, I think on one of the first slides, you'd mentioned that there were some challenges um, being a member of an organization. I didn't quite catch the acronym, um, but I wondered if you could talk just a little bit about that. I noticed there was, um, you had UDH or GIS uh, in there, and I wondered if you could just expand on that a little. Uh, so whenever I originally uh, took on the project, I broke everything GIS, didn't even consider them. 
actually came back from COVID and I was working on it, you know, all through 2020, hanging out in my little laundry room office that was supposed to be like two weeks, you know, that ended up being a year. And so, uh, as we, as we moved through that, I, I didn't realize what I was breaking. Uh, I wanted just things to go from, from a designer standpoint. I was tunnel vision all the way through and through on how that looked. Uh, so I broke, I broke the GIS, but the mapping department never said it was broken. They just kept on trucking. and they're like, oh, we just reverted back to our old ways. And so that was not very useful. So getting them involved was, uh, was good to, but it took a while for that to happen. Uh, from the EAM side of things, I don't think we ever had any major hurdles. Uh, everything was CU based and it just, it seemed to operate. Okay. The only, the only issues that we ran across on that side, uh, was they call them variables inside. So like wire, wire sizing, if you pull in a, a dead end insulator or an elbow, if you're using 260 mil or, um, 345 mil insulation or something like that, those variables really, they got screwy and they still really, we still never really fixed that variable. And so they just have to do it manually as they go through the accounting and on the estimate side, they have to specify those variables, uh, of what that looks like outside of that my lift on those things we ended up going back with sbs and getting in and revamping the gis side and uh paul cleary was one of our other guys in gravel chimed in on a few of those as far as like getting off the ground there um but it was uh i don't think i was cleary's favorite uh just because i didn't know what i was doing uh, and i didn't take gis into account we got them involved uh, and they kind of knew how to speak the language. Uh, Megan was saying that we were part of NISC, and that's kind of like a mothership accounting firm and and material counting side of things for like all cooperatives. Most of them subscribe to that. They're not using Maximo SAP or any of those other, uh, I think Bentley, some of the other pro products out there. Uh, it's all kind of encompassing in one. Uh, that was challenging because they have their own SQL server things that they have to, the cybersecurity side of things. It was like, I don't know if we can give you access. And like, we already have it. Just keep, just give us what we want. And getting our GIS mapping, SBS, and them to all communicate. And it was a nightmare. Actually, we ended up kind of like, we got it like 80% okay. And they literally contacted me six months after I just gave up of three months of trying with them. They said, Hey, do you want to close this ticket? And you're like, F you we're done. So that was my, that was my thing. So NISC, we, we refer to it as utility in a box. They give you the finance system, the design tool, with their GIS format, and they run your accounting for you. So we have to map to them. So core here is the same system. And, they were the first um, integration with it, and he said it was very difficult because they wanted a, a multi-speak, one-way interface, and that would say, well, I'm as a designer, can only see my data. I can't see what anything else is going on. So that's when we put in UDHEAM to say, hey, don't just put the middle database so you can share it out a little bit. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> uh, this kind of relates to, to some of the stuff that uh, Hyder Long was talking about. I'm just curious about uh, maybe a little bit more information about uh, the scenarios where uh, the designers get uh, frustrated and turn off the validation. Um, a, a couple things about that. One, uh, I'm curious that the types of things that are leading to that, the types of scenarios that are leading to that becoming a, a, a problem. Uh, I suspect that it probably reaches a sheer number of uh, validation errors that are, that are too much to manage or there are specific blocking validations that might interrupt the the design is are both of those kind of the scenario or is it uh what's the kind of situation uh you're running into with that i think it's the blocking where we're needing to add material in and however the rule is written it won't let us add it it'll just keep kicking it off um we have to turn sometimes we have all-in-one pad mount basements for our transformers now um if you don't have your validations turned off, you can't switch it to, maybe it was an old one with a sleeve and a non-concrete pad. 
Um, so if the validations aren't off, we won't, it won't let us change it. You know, you can turn that off on an individual feature. You can, on the feature, you can say, do not auto resolve. And then yes. do it. And I guess that's where, that's why I say we turn off the validations. It's usually for one off situations. Like dead ends are kind of like a, a thing for us. I, I don't know why it, it was, but maybe we just have it configured poorly. I don't know. As, as far as the defaults are concerned. So do you mean you're turning the, the validation off like the main, all the validation on the whole design or just I, like, like I never that did, one error? But I know some of the designers do. It's the, okay. fir it's the, it's their first order of business and <laughs> validations off. Um, but not all of these, some there, I know of one specifically, uh, uh, he, but you know what, from Trico, and I'll talk about this later, actually, in another presentation, is some people are really hardcore on standards. You, Hydro One, don't turn the validations off. It's not a good design. I just want it to look good on paper, bro, and we're done. You know, And if I can go in and I'm not having to worry about, um, you know, on the as-built end of things, it was as long as the material turned out good, everyone was actually pretty okay. Uh, it, it just because the as built kind of trued everything up for us on the tail end. I, I guess what I'm really curious about is that then if there's just a couple uh, blocking validations that could be ignored, that's one thing. But I would imagine if you get a whole slew of those, that's not really workable to have to go through and ignore like a whole series, whole series of them, right? And that's why I turned off all of them. Yeah. Uh, but it's some of it. He, I'm like, I asked him the last time, I'm like, why do you turn all these off? And he's like, that's just what I do. So it's like teaching an old dog new tricks, but he just dug in real hard and that's what he did. And he spits out designs, so we'll let him spit out designs.